Uh, hi, Rob. It's uh, great to be with you. Uh, for those of you that don't know, so a friend of mine called Rob Cates, he was with us at the Father Heart Conference, and I've asked him um, to be with us today to, to look at um, what it means to be a prophet and how prophets equip the church for works of service. So, Rob, why don't you uh, kind of introduce yourself, kind of, um, before we get into the text, why don't you just yeah, tell us what you do, where you work, where you're based, that'd be really helpful. Awesome. Hi, Dave. It's so good to see you. It's good to see all of you who are jumping on this today as well. It was great to be with you all earlier in the year. And um, yeah, I hope you guys are all doing really, really well. So yeah, I'm Rob and uh, I, I live in North London and uh, kind of three days a week my, my job is I'm a vocal coach, so like a singing teacher. And then the rest of my life is uh, spent doing ministry stuff. And so um, I'm a prophet, I'm part of the Global Prophetic Alliance and the British Isles Council of Prophets. Um, and so uh, you'll see me occasionally on the British Isles Council of Prophets face Facebook Lives on a Monday or a Friday morning, uh, various other things uh, that pop up online a bit like this. And uh, yeah, so it's just kind of my joy and my privilege to yeah get to prophesy either over individuals, over organisations, you know the door the lord's opening up the doors <clears throat> excuse me at the moment to speak to politicians into celebrities and then into church leaders and all kinds of stuff so god is just really uh you know highlighting the prophetic in this season opening doors for his voice to be heard which is just a really amazing privilege to be part of wow it's fantastic so rob we've been looking at the whole book of ephesians and we've been camping in on ephesians 4 and so for those of you that have been journeying with us, we had Wendy Mann a couple of weeks ago, who we just did an overview of the fivefold gifts and how they all kind of work together. And then uh, last week, we had some time with Andy Robinson looking at the apostle and being an apostolic people, a sent people. And so today we've got Rob and we're going to look at um, the role and function of a prophet and how we can grow as prophetic people. And so let me just read the text to us. And then I'm going to ask Rob some questions around that and just dialogue with him about that. And hopefully it will equip you to know Jesus more and live out your faith and be equipped prophetically for where God has assigned you. So this is what it says um, in Ephesians 4. I'm going to pick up um, just at verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we'll be no longer uh, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up and become in every way a mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body is joined and held together by its supporting ligaments and grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so, Rob, I've known you for a little while now. And when I first met you, I would, you know, think, okay, Rob's a worship leader. And, you know, over the last five or six years, it wasn't that your worship wasn't prophetic. It wasn't that it wasn't good, but you've kind of really gone on this journey of, yes, you still lead worship, but your primary gifting seems to have moved towards this role of being a prophet. And I just wonder if you could help us just unpack that. What is the difference between being someone who prophesies by the Holy Spirit and someone who is considered to have the office of prophet as given by Christ here um, in this scripture? Yeah, what an awesome scripture. It's a, it's a weighty responsibility in that scripture until we all attain the fullness of yeah. Christ. I mean, it's like, it's not like until we attain the half measure, until we attain the fullness of Christ. So it's a, it's a pretty hef hefty thing. Uh, but I think uh, the thing that stands out is the word there that you use. You use the word gift. And I think if we look at 1 Corinthians 14, which talks about the gift of prophecy, we see that the gift of prophecy is given a shed abroad. Paul says, yeah. earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And some translations talk about, uh, it says the translation is, so that all may prophesy. Yeah. And, and the intention is, there is that every member of the body of Christ would be able to operate in the gift of prophecy. So 
What that means is we wait on the Holy Spirit and we earnestly ask him, we say, Holy Spirit, would you bestow on me? Would you give me the gift of prophecy that I may love other people with it? Uh, because, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 14 says, let love be your highest goal. So it's the gifts are given for loving people. Yeah. So that is the gift is received and then we use it to love people one at a time. So that's the gift of prophecy. Whereas that Ephesians 4 passage says that uh, Christ gave gifts to the church and the gifts were the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers. So a prophet is a gift to the church. It's not that they have the gift of prophecy. They are the gift. And so whereas someone who uh, operates in the gift of prophecy, they receive a word and they give a word, a word of prophecy. Whereas the prophet is the word. <laughs> it's like their life is the prophetic message. We only have to look at the lives of the Old Testament prophets to see that. Like, but you know, like, uh, for instance, let's take Ezekiel, you know, like everything in his life was a sign, was a prophetic sign. So everything he did was to demonstrate the word of God or even Hosea, who's asked to marry a prostitute to yeah. demonstrate the prophetic word of the Lord. His life was the word uh you know i don't know how many of us god has said to you lie on your side for a year cook food over your own dried poo and hide your underwear under a rock you know that's that was ezekiel's life <clears throat> but here's the thing for uh for the the that fundamental difference is, means this. It's not that you have received the gift of prophecy and then graduate to being a prophet. Right. That doesn't happen. Yeah. It doesn't happen. They, If you imagine them as swimming pools, they're different pools. They're different pools. You can be in the shallow end of the gift of prophecy and you can be in the shallow end of being in the office of a prophet. What's the great news about that? There is a deep end that you can swim to. So you, we can all swim out into the deeper waters, whichever God has called us to. And it's not that the office of the prophet is someone who's simply better at prophecy, because I know many people who operate in the gift of prophecy who are extraordinary at giving prophetic words, more than lots of people I know who are in the office of prophecy. Prophet. In fact, I know some people who are in the office of prophet who freak out if you ask them to give a prophetic word. But because it's not about giving a prophetic word, but being a prophet, being a sign, sorry, being the word, it's a different call and it's a different metron. So if you have one prophet in the room, they could give a hundred words to the hundred people in there. But it take a long time. Whereas if the gift is given by the Holy Spirit to all 100 people there, they can give 100 prophetic words in the time it takes the prophet to give one. So we want to say we want the proliferation of the gift of prophecy amongst all. And yes, we want to see more and more prophets raised up. Uh, but um, uh, our, our goal is that everyone would come to that maturity. And I think if I was going to say this, uh, what is the, I, I, you're probably going to come to this, but the role of the prophet in equipping the saints is this. Someone who has the gift of prophecy doesn't really have a grace on their life to release other people en masse into the gift of prophecy. They can pray for them and they can say, Holy Spirit, come, would you give them the gift of prophecy? And that may well happen, but they don't really have the grace to actually raise that person in the prophetic, particularly. Uh, I have not seen anyone with the gift of prophecy effectively release other people into prophecy. That is the role of the prophet and the grace that's on a prophet's life is to activate and release the body into operating in the prophetic ministry. Yeah. Uh, and that is the power. So when you see a, when you, when a prophet comes into the room and they start teaching on prophecy, they start doing activation. It's like electricity in the room because that's the grace that's on them for that. When I've seen people with the gift of prophecy, do I don't mean to be rude to anyone who's tried to do it, but it's so boring. It's so boring. It's so dry. There's no life in it. It's not exciting. You start to see people fall asleep. I mean, it's just there's just no energy with it because it's not the grace on their life, you know, and they, what tends to happen is they tend to teach it rather than model it rather than call it up and out. So that's a very, very brief kind of just overview. I'm going to pick you up on a couple of things. So 
you dropped in the word <laughs> met metron there, which is not a word that many of us use. It just is the Greek word for sphere of influence, like your spiritual sphere of influence. Um, but I think something you said that was really interesting there. So you talked about prophets, like they, and I've often heard this, like a prophet is the message, or you said they are the word. And this passage talks about, you know, these different gifts, apostles, pastors, prophets, um, equipping us to understand God. And so I was thinking, okay, so if you've got a prophet in your mix and they're, they're a living word, a living sign, as you're saying, then what revelation are they giving us of God that's maybe different from the pastor, the prophet, uh, sorry, the pastor, the evangelist, the, the apostle? And I guess what I would say is, so for that right now, Rob, what is it that you think that God's kind of put on you as a living sign right now that we're thinking, okay, I want to read the book of Rob's life because I want to have a knowledge of God. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's such a good question. It's in multiple parts. You may need to remind me of the different parts. I might forget, <laughs> but um, so if I start at the end and then we can work back. So in terms of my life, what does it look like? Uh, for a prophet, almost everything that happens in their life means something. Now, people will say, oh, you're just reading into that. It's no, 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 it's really true. So for instance, I'm going to show you, I'm going to turn my camera around so you can see. So up here, I have my glowing globe. Okay. So the Lord, it was my birthday in September and the Lord nudged me to buy a globe. And I'm like, why, why, why am I doing this? I loved the idea. It was like, yeah, I'm going to get a globe, but why, what's going on? I knew there had to be something. I'm like, surely it's about intercession. It's about being able to go to the globe, lay my hands on it, pray, etc. <laughs> But then what the Lord did is I've got a picture on the wall over there, which um, is from Matthew 5, where Jesus says to the disciples, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. You are a lamp on a stand. It's remarkable that Jesus didn't say, I am the light of the world. He did elsewhere. But there he said, you are the light of the world. And a number of years ago, many years ago, the Lord said to me for my birthday, he said, you are the light of the world, Rob. You are a city on a hill, you are on a lamp on a stand, and I've called you to shine on a global stage. I've called you to shine on a national stage and on a local stage. Guess what the name Robert means? It means bright fame. And the Lord was saying this to me. And then a friend of mine came and they gave me that picture for my birthday, not knowing that the Lord had spoken to me from that very scripture. And it's a Hannah Dunnett picture with the city on the hill and the words of the scriptures written all over it. And so, uh, and the Lord asked me this year to buy this globe for myself. And then suddenly the penny dropped. This is the Lord reminding me that even though I'm in lockdown and even though I'm in one place, actually the call on my life is something else. The call on my life is not to be stuck in my room, but the Lord is saying, I'm about to release you in the next season of your life. Things are going to open up beyond what you could imagine. So that's how symbolic things in my life are. Plus out the back here, they knocked down two houses and are now building a block of flats. And the Lord said to me, I'm knocking you down and I'm building you up again. Now you could just say, oh, that's just coincidence. Anyone could have heard that, but I'm telling you, no, this is the word of the Lord. And the past season, I have, the, I have been ripped apart like many of us. But here's the thing for me as a prophet is very often I experience what God is saying. I don't just hear it, I experience it. And I will experience what is happening ahead of time. So I've just been through a really intense season of grieving. And I'm like, why am I grieving? No one has died, but like the intense grieving thing and all of the emotions that come with that grieving, I believe is to do with what God is about to happen in the nation. I'm not prophesying doom and gloom, but I am saying I actually believe that this winter is gonna be very challenging. So why did I as a prophet go through that in the summer when everyone else is like oh it's great we're hanging outside it's fine we're gonna coming out of lockdown and it's getting better it's getting better celebrate celebrate woohoo it's summer and i'm like oh you yeah. know because why because god is preparing me and the other prophets many of the prophets have felt the same thing so that when we the nation hits that point we actually have a paradigm to speak into it we have compassion to speak into it we have the experience um so i think for did that answer the question? Probably not. No, no, it's helpful. I guess that I want to get really practical. With it. So, you know, as a non-prophetic person, not saying I am, but just, you know, as a yeah. non-prophet, and I'm looking at you and I'm thinking, okay, so I'm meant to receive a grace from your life that's going to equip oh. me in the knowledge of God and 
to demonstrate yes. the kingdom. So it's summer. Let's take the example you used. It's summer. I'm like, well, hey, I'm out of lockdown. I'm getting to meet up with six people. You're in doom and gloom phase, you know, because almost you're living outside of time and you're kind of living in December, although it's August. And, and this is kind of the thing that I want, <laughs> yeah. I want us to grapple with because we so often, the nation of Israel heard prophets and just didn't align with them. And then they just got trashed by their enemies. You know, that is basically the book of Kings and Chronicles. <laughs> um, prophets spoke, Israel aligned and it was blessed. Israel didn't align and it was cursed and thrown out. And I, and I guess so for us, I, I want to be hearing the voice of a prophet, their knowledge, their revelation, and then working out what I do with that, because this text tells me that you're going to equip me with a grace that I need to be an effective saint. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And I think that's the thing head on is that the gift talks about encouragement, edification, exhortation, etc. Whereas the office of the prophet, we bring the not so fun things like the the warnings, we bring the correction, the direction, we bring the, the this is what we need to be praying about. This is how we need to prepare. This is uh, so one of the things the prophet does is they prepare the body for what is to come. They help the body to align. They're like the compass saying, actually, this is the way we're meant to go now. Uh, they, they're, they're like the weather vane saying, the season has changed. The wind is blowing that direction. You may not be able to feel it or see it yet, but that is where we're meant to go. Or it may be even very practically, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, you know, the prophets, for instance, Dr. Sharon released a word, Dr. Sharon Stone, that is, she released a word in 2008 uh, saying, financial calamity is coming it's time to restructure your financial investments those people who listened to her which was not many uh, uh they actually prospered through through the financial crisis of 2008 etc but those who didn't they reaped uh, uh you know the negative consequences of not listening to that word and so the prophets bring those words but yeah like you said they also point us to god why because they help us make sense of the times and the seasons that we are in, and so I, uh, I, I am also aware that the Lord, the Lord had me release a prophetic word near the beginning of lockdown. I actually sliced my finger open, and the Lord said, and, and it just wouldn't stop bleeding. It would not stop bleeding, and nothing that I would do would cause it to stop bleeding. And and the Lord says, I'm coming to bring a deeper circumcision of the heart, and wow. you need to let me go deeper with that word. And so this again, this is being the signs prophet and the Lord was saying, let this lockdown season be the time where I cut away everything that is not there. And so I released a word to say some of you are feeling this, that and the other because God is wanting to do this in your life. And so the role of the prophet is to help people make sense, I think, of very often what they're seeing, what they're feeling and the craziness in the world around about us uh, uh, in preparation. And also to help us understand, uh, and the, the, the prophets teach the scriptures in a different way. They see it in a slightly different way to the teachers and the evangelists and the, the apostles, and that's as it should be. Uh, and so when the prophets teach the scriptures, uh, they teach it in a way for us to be able to see that prophetic trajectory of history leading up to the ultimate revelation in, at the end of the book and when we're all being prepared. And so I think that fits with the different narratives. So, But I think the prophet stands more from the position of being the mouthpiece of God to the people, whereas the pastor is like helping the people to be the mouthpiece for uh, for God to him. And the evangelist, it's like they're helping people to be the mouthpiece to the masses to bring the word of God in terms of the gospel of salvation to the people. Whereas I think primarily the, the prophets, it's just like whoever, the metron, as you said, the sphere of influence that God has called the individual prophet to speak into. So some will speak more to the church and some will speak more to the world and different sectors. So uh, I think it's to help be translators of yeah. times and seasons and also what God is doing. I think that's the big thing, to be a translator. So I, I guess which would bring me on to my, my next kind of question. So, you know, as a prophet, as, as someone who's kind of seeing and hearing, um, you know, what what are you sensing that God is saying for us as a people, us as a community? Because we you know we want to we want to be led by the voice of the Lord, and we want to hear. Yeah. And I think you know I have I have ideas. People in our church have ideas, but also we you know we want to. 
it's a wonderful thing here. I think this sort of sense of mutual submission that, you know, one gift lays it down to another, whether that's, you know, being the gift of the leader of the church or an apostolic gift or a prophetic gift, you, you, you mutually submit to one another and work out the way to go. And I think, you know, I, I'm always thinking, right, so I need to hear what people are saying pastorally and evangelistically and prophetically and apostolically right. and lay it all down and like, you know, bake a cake with it, basically. It's like different ingredients and you make a great something to eat. And so, you know, what what is it that you're maybe sensing for, uh, like on a big picture, like what's God saying now? And then, you know, what for us on a local picture as a community um, that you think, actually, this is what I feel God is saying to you and you need to pay attention. <laughs> Let me, can I just make one comment on what you said about the fivefold? Because I love it. I think here's the thing. A lot of people are afraid of prophets and they're afraid of the prophetic. Um, and we, we, for hundreds of years, have embraced the pastoral and teaching gifts. Uh, and we have, in recent years, seen the awakening of the apostolic again, which is really great, and the prophetic. But here's the thing. Everyone in the body of Christ operates best when they're the most extreme version of themselves, not when they're a dumbed down version of themselves. Yeah. And so when you have got an apostle being extremely apostolic, a prophet being extremely prophetic, a pastor being extreme. And one of the things I think particularly for us in British culture is we like everything to just kind of be a little bit dumbed down. And, you know, if I if I stop being quite so prophetic and try and make everything as acceptable as possible in the way that I communicate it, then that will make it easier for everyone and we'll all get along a bit better. No, that's completely. <laughs> Bunk. What we want is the prophets to be the most extreme radical prophets they can possibly be. It may scare the pants off everyone else, but that's not the point. That's then the role of the pastor to do the cuddling, you know, and, and to be the most extreme pastor they can possibly be. We want everyone in the fivefold to push out to the edges and the extremes so that we can be really, really vibrant in that uh, and not this kind of homogenized mush in the middle. So anyway, that's just kind of my little two penneth on that. But I think in terms of the big picture, the word the Lord has been speaking to me is we are in the crucible. You know, we are in the crucible being refined by fire and, and we want to jump out because it's not nice. It's like, will someone stop the world from spinning? I want to get off. No, it's not going to happen. And so here's the thing. The word of the Lord to us, the body of Christ is let me refine you in the fire that you may come out like gold, you know, shining that revelation passage where it's like I've called you to be gold. And the Lord has given me an extensive word on it. But the highlights of this. The Lord says, I'm bringing you into the golden era of the church in the next season as you come out of this. And the Lord has been saying, even as the golden era of Israel under King David and King Solomon was marked by unprecedented worship. So this next season will be marked by unprecedented worship. It was marked by unprecedented expansion of the nation. And the Lord says, you're going to see unprecedented expansion of the kingdom of God in the earth realm. Uh, but it was also marked marked by unprecedented peace and unity amongst the tribes. And the Lord says, you are going to start seeing unprecedented unity amongst the body of Christ with the breaking down of denominationalism. And so the Lord said, but what is it? It's purity, purity, purity. The fire brings purity. And what does that mean? It's the drawing of lines in the sand and saying, actually on the morality and ethical issues and the fundamentals of the kingdom of God, the principles of the gospel, we will not compromise even if the enemy brings his fire and even if it becomes like the baptism of fire under Nero we will not compromise what God is saying and so that in a nutshell is what I'm saying and uh, just as the sign of that the Lord has been I've been I've been ring hunting for gold because the Lord was telling me I want you to own gold so go buy gold God, Rob so this is great this is awesome this is a great part of being a prophet but anyway, so that's that. But you, you see, the refining, I believe, then comes down, yes, to the personal level, to the individual, but it comes down to the corporate local as well. And yeah. um, what we were chatting about earlier, Dave, before we came on, I had a word for you guys as a church. Let me just find my notes on it because I think it's important that I stick to that, but it may flow as well. But um, the Lord was saying that um, 
uh, over you guys. These are the days of an entrepreneurial grace being poured out on the members of your congregation. But also as a corporate body that I saw that these are the days of great adventure, great endeavor and great taking risks. And even in the realm of investments and finances and all that kind of stuff, I feel like God is saying that he is raising the level of responsibility amongst the people in general for financial purity, but also for financial uh, 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 having a financial savvy about them, but also that there is, it's going to be a time where the church becomes a bridge between those who have and those who do not, between the wealthy and between the poor. And the Lord is saying that there is a skepticism in the earth, particularly in this nation, to do with large organizations. And the whole thing of is money being used appropriately? Is it being embezzled? All that kind of stuff. And I felt like the Lord was saying there's a grace on you in your smallness to be able to be uh, really um, accountable for the way that you help steward and connect uh, resource and need. And that the Lord was saying that there is going to grow up amongst you almost like a kingdom financial wisdom that you can use to then influence the wealthy because as they give, they're going to receive even more and it's going to be like why as I give to you people particularly above anyone else do I seem to receive more and the Lord is going to teach you guys how to teach them about the principles of kingdom finance and the Lord has been saying to me over the last number of years Babylon will pay for revival and I see it's not that we uh, uh, we, we're not going to be those who uh, participate or prop up the systems of Babylon but we're going to be the ones who plunder the systems of Babylon for the kingdom in the name of Jesus and I, I, I saw uh, uh, the Lord said to me this morning that he's sending you guys out two by two to bring in the harvest two by two, even as the harvest came into, even as the, the, the animals came into the ark two by two. But the Lord is saying, you know, even as uh, Noah was asked to build an ark in a season without water or rain, so he's asking you guys to build something that does not look like what is needed even now in this season for a future season when the flood comes and the people come in. But even, yes, you are going to go out in two by twos. And I saw you guys handing out tickets to the marriage feast of the Lamb and inviting people in. And I saw a lot of people responding to that invitation because they're so hungry. You're offering me a ticket to a meal? Yes, I'm coming. I'm coming. Um, but, but. How did the animals come into the ark? No one knows. The Lord sent them. And the Lord is saying he is sending those and you will not even know how they've come. But the Lord says, even in the previous years, the things that you have sown, the things that you have, the seeds that you have sown all over the place. The Lord says they have been in the winter, even as acorns need the frost and they need the winter in order to germinate. The Lord says in the winter that has been this season, the Lord says, I'm about to trigger the germination of the seeds that were planted many years ago and they're about to come to fruition. So, and I also see in the midst of all of this, I think the word that I, I feel is on your community is generosity and philanthropy. Those are the things that God is going to prosper you. And in 2019, this time last year, at the British Isles Council of Prophets, the Lord said to me that he was going to prosper the believers who walked in the fear of the Lord in the midst of national calamity beyond anything that is reasonable or logical. And so I really feel like there is a stewarding of the fear of the Lord that leads to this prosperity. It's not just financial prosperity for bigger house, bigger car, me, myself and I. It's for the purposes of the kingdom and revival. So that's what I felt was over you guys. So being a bridge between resource and need that demonstrates the love and power of God, even in the midst of this national calamity wow it's amazing it's great we we just want to receive that and we want to camp on it as a community and i'm sure we will in the coming weeks and i think when we were talking just before you kind of press the record do you talk about a word that was on your phone around being small or something moses now what was it what was it there was something oh i yeah 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 i i um i one of the things in this season is that people have wanted to replicate Sunday church online. And, and I actually, um, I actually, as do lots of the prophets, we actually felt that was like a major mistake that the Lord was stripping away lots of stuff. Um, and, and I actually felt that, yeah, I remember now. And, and the Lord was saying that, you know, 
he is raising up the incandescent burning ones from a small group. And the Lord was saying, it's better to have a small group of incandescent burning ones who are burning brightly as beacons rather than a kind of just a smoldering, you know, you know, when the fire is just kind of smoldering away. Uh, and so I really felt like the Lord is saying he's making your church a beacon of hope to your community. Um, and so I really feel like the call is for people is to really ask for the fire of God to come and set you on fire, to be burning with an incandescent fire. And that may make some people in the congregation quite uncomfortable because of how extreme it is. It kind of goes back to that pushing out to the extremes. This is a season of extremes, people. Let's go for it. Let's really, really, really go for it. And I just think my, my, I do have a bit of pastoralness in me somewhere. Um, actually, that's not even true. The Lord's been putting a really deep compassion in me in this season, which actually has made my prophetic quite struggle because I know sometimes when the Lord asks me to speak a word that actually pastorally it's really hard and my heart's like, ah, this is a horrible thing to have to say. But I feel like the Lord is saying, if you are struggling right now, if you are struggling right now, he is there with you in the midst of it. If you feel like I don't have anything left, I can't do anything. I just want to say to you, throw yourself on Jesus. Throw yourself on his mercy. Invite him in deeper. He will meet you to the degree that you're yielded to him. That doesn't mean the extent to which you fast. I haven't been able to fast in this last season. I've wanted to, but I've not been well enough to fast. And I've not been, I've not had the capacity. And I just want to say to you, this is not about praying in tongues for 15 hours a day and doing 21 day fasts on air. You know, that's not what this is about. This is about simply coming before the Lord and yielding and saying, do whatever you've got to do in me to do whatever you want to do through me. Yeah. Now, I'm telling you, if you pray that prayer and you mean it, he will come and it will be uncomfortable. But he will do something so glorious in you that it will be amazing. So in your weakness, let yourself admit your weakness before him and he will come and meet you in that place. Jesus loves it when we tell him, I can't, Jesus, but you can. Thank you. Uh, there's just so much in there for us to, <clears throat> to take. A, and I, I would love, I'd love to keep chatting, to be honest, because I just love hearing what you're saying. Um, but can you pray for us as a community and just bless us as we bring our time to an end? That would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Father God, I thank you so much for uh, the community church. Father God, I thank you uh, for this uh, group of believers, Father God. And I feel like the spirit of the Lord saying, even now, there are some of you who you just feel like a remnant. And I feel you feel like you're on a raft in the middle of an ocean and that there is nothing else around. It's almost like you feel like you're in a, a, a desert. You're like the remnant in the middle of this desert, just crying out to the Lord. And the Lord says, you are coming into a season where you are going to see the fish jump into the boat. You are. But the Lord says, do not waste this moment to allow me to refine you. So, Father God, in the name of Jesus, even where people are feeling isolated, bereft or whatever, God, I pray, come with your fire and bring refinement to us. Oh God, let us invite you deeper into that place. Set us on fire to be those incandescent burning ones. God, break off the heaviness, Father God, of this season and bring your life and your joy on the inside so that no matter what our circumstances oh god we would press into you father god whether that just means we lie on the floor and wait for you to come or whether we're marching around doing spiritual warfare god whatever god come be the strength on the inside of us open the eyes and the ears of our heart to comprehend your love oh god that we may be strengthened in this season put us in that crucible let us not jump out of it god because it's uncomfortable refine us to be that pure your shining gold for you, Father God, that everyone around about us would see. And God, I'm asking, release that entrepreneurial, generous, philanthropic grace to connect, Father God, and to bring the wisdom of heaven, Father God, to both those at the wealthy end and those at the poor end, Father God. May this church shine, Father God, amongst a wicked and crooked generation, Father God, as a beacon of hope for your glory, I pray, and for their joy and the joy of their community. In Jesus' precious name amen 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 amazing thank you so much rob uh well it's been great to be with you oh, thank you if you want to connect with us more as a church you can do that check out our website our facebook page it's been great to be with you this morning have a blessed week do you want to say bye rob <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. great to be with you bless you all